So hello, and welcome to another exciting edition of Scarlet Vetch. I'm Anthony. And I'm Jason. Um, so we are going to um, jump off right off the bat. Um, a lot of stuff has come out since we podcasted, and we want to get to them all. Um, I, th- I think the first thing that we're going to jump right into is um, kind of uh, warmly welcome our newest uh, Vetch. Um, it was revealed in the latest edition of or actually not the latest, but the one right before of Extreme X- X-Men, um, that General Howlett, who is an alternate universe version of our Wolverine. Is it General Howlett or Captain Howlett? I, I believe it's General Howlett. At, okay. at least that's what I read on Newsarama, but Newsarama also gets their shit wrong a lot. So. I and know. I consulted the ever-wise Google ah. for my... Well... So. Who knows? Well, everyone just calls him Howlett, so we'll just, we'll, let's call him Howlett. Okay. Um, <laughs> or, or Gunslinger Hallow, whatever you want to call him. Um, who's the... Yeah, so he has been revealed in um, a, a recent edition of Extreme X-Men uh, that he had a uh, relationship with his, or some kind of sexual encounter with his universe's Hercules, um, which was kind of like... I mean, I guess it's not super kind of like crazy because A, um, Wolverine's son Dakin is like totally like kind of queer oh, and yeah. it run, runs in the family. Yeah, um, but it runs in the family maternally. Um, and... It's, haven't they, they've, they've shown that like it's yeah. the risk factor is on the mitochondria. So it's like... Oh. Hush, hush, hush. This is comic books. This is comic books. I'm pretty sure that Dakin was conceived by an alternate universe female Wolverine or something. <laughs> um, but, but, so, but the, the funny thing that I kind of like, it was a light bulb that, that Dean, uh, while I was writing the bachelor post, was that, so Extreme X-Men is written by Greg Pak, who's like my like comic book like hubby. I mean, so I have the biggest crush on Greg Pak. Um, he's this like Korean lumberjack of a man, and I love him. But anyway, so Greg Pak, who's famous for a lot of things like World War Hulk and Incredible Hercules, all that stuff, um, he uh, kind of also um, kind of made some waves in the queer comic blogosphere uh, when in uh, after like right after Chaos War, after Hercules was like, killed or whatever. Um, during his funeral, it was revealed that Hercules had, in the 616 universe, had had a encounter with North Star. So, like, Hercules slash North Star was officially canon. Um, so, I thought it was really awesome that Greg Pak is continuing to queer the Marvel Universe one Hercules <laughs> slash pairing at a time, which I think is brilliant. <laughs> it's awesome. But I wanted to say that when I was writing uh, The Scarlet Bitch after that, uh, so this week's, I uh, went back and read that issue to see, like, okay, was it just a fling? Was it a meaningful relationship? And if I, reading the expression in the art, I would say that they had more than, like, you know, a a week in Vegas or whatever. Mm -hmm. It seems like they, like, at least for Howlett, there was some emotional investment in yeah. the relationship. So that's what that's what tipped me over the scale from saying like, oh, he's just flexible to actually I think he's I think he's a queero. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm very excited. I think it'll be awesome. I was really hoping this would be like a younger but not <laughs> prepubescent uh, alternate version of Howlett that we encountered in Steampunk Old West. But in this latest issue, uh, but no, it's like eleven-year-old Wolverine. Mm-hmm. So that's true. Although I think that <laughs> I, I found eleven-year-old Wolverine actually kind of adorable. I kind of like wanted to like squeeze him. <laughs> oh, he's awesome. He's so awesome. But he's—I was kind of hoping that they would deal with like his first crush or whatever. Oh uh, yeah. No, no dice. Yeah, uh, I'm also—I was also surprised to see his father because I don't think I—I'm I, not super up on Wolverine lore, but I don't know if we've ever seen Wolverine's father before. That's just oh. me. I don't know. Definitely in, in Wolverine Origins, when they had his whole story about like oh, yeah. his bone claws and everything first manifesting, that's, they did have that. Oh, okay. Yeah, they did have his father. Uh, but, yeah, it was not 
I mean, wasn't ever really in any major comic books. It was just in that limited series. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's interesting. He's a good. It's interesting to see his family and stuff. Uh, one of the things that I was weirded out about is that I did not realize that extreme means steampunk. Not always. Uh, always. Every single universe that they've been to so far, there was the steampunk. Well, no, the, the one with the gods is not really steampunk. Oh, I guess it was kind of steampunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was all steampunks. All of it. Well, the, this western one isn't steampunk. It's like western. It's like American. And like, not. I mean, people, they're not dressed like, you know, they don't have like... The, 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 the classic definition of steampunk, steampunk is the retrofuturism of... Uh, or not retrofuturism, but like, like you know, the retrofuturism of you know Victorian England. It, 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 it's emblematic of, of that kind of like the meeting of I would steam, argue that power they and like Victorianism. No, but like no, they're like they're they're attired as completely like American Wild West. Okay, okay, but uh, anachronistic. I don't know. They're very punk, and they have those yeah. weird guns that are look steampunkish to me. And okay. everyone's wearing goggles. That's very steampunk. Okay, you have to admit. I, it, it, I guess, I guess it is as steampunk as Wild Wild West with Will Smith is <laughs> steampunk. Okay, we'll go with that. And I would also argue that, uh, yeah, that Wild Wild West was a little bit steampunk. A little bit. Well, ah, with this giant robot spider. I did not see that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I just like. Yeah, I've been, I've been, I haven't watched a Will Smith movie since like God, Independence like Day? Men in Black Two, I think. Oh yeah, I guess so. It came out later. Yeah. Oh, Will Smith. Anyway, Back on topic. <laughs> of other things to talk about. Let's talk about Astonishing X Men. Yes. Um. So, I guess we get we we kind of get the big reveal about who this person who's been fucking with the X Men for so long finally is. Um, on yeah, a side she note, really I mean, is because we we were introduced to her last issue. Yeah, but now we get to know exactly who this person is. Um, as a side note, uh, Marjorie, I I friended Marjorie Liu on Facebook, and she probably just like, accepts everyone. But the fact that Marjorie Liu shows up on my Facebook feed as being like blah 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 blah, and like her random like personal like thoughts, I'm like, oh my god, this is so exciting. And then I realized, I'm like, oh, my, you're a real person, and I'm reading your comic book. It's, it's kind of hilarious. Um, That's amazing. I know, right? I'm such a fanboy. But um, so uh, it, it's interesting for me to read um, this uh, kind of storyline in uh, Sun and Shining because we kind of were complaining about how, like, karma is just, like, perpetually victimized, or how she's defined by her victimization. Um, and so, so it's just interesting how that gets kind of like played up again in this, you know, storyline, especially since it's like being written by like an Asian woman who, mm-hmm. I don't know, it, 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 like, I think about like how, how much that, how much residence or how much uh, effect that has, that would, that would have on the character, writing the character. I do think that it's interesting how um, the, this team of X-Men, it like, it, it, the, I mean, it's they're, they're clearly not like kind of like the main players. This is astonishing for a long time was like, you know, Cyclops, Emma, you know, Beast, Wolverine. Those are like the, the main the heavy hitters. And now it's kind of all these kind of like listers that are like kind of doing their own shit. Um, kind of, but I feel like it's not B listers as much as it's the most lady crushable. Does that make sense? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, Gambit has been for Marjorie Lou's run on X-23 and Dakin's uh, Dark Wolverine, like, her character. Like, yeah. Yeah, and I think I've said on this before that Marjorie Lou's depiction of Gambit is one of the few characterizations of Gambit that I like. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, and bringing in Iceman, who so many people have, like, because they had that thing with Northstar having a crush on Iceman, and then... He's also, like, the young Twinkie one. I don't know. I just feel like it's very... These are the crushable ex-dudes. Yeah, yeah I can see that. Yeah. Um, so, I guess the first few things. So, it's revealed that this big villain that we've, that we've been working, like, so many issues. I mean, like, the like the, the, the dramatic arc in this, uh, in this storyline has... 
has been really, really drawn out. Especially, like, I mean, for comic books, like, you usually, like, by, like, the second or third issue, you, like, you, like, figure out who the big bad is, and then, like, you know, you work towards resolution. But this has been kind of, like, a while. Um, the interesting but, thing about it is that I feel like it's been much more than six, like, it's been six issues since the start of this, and we never saw the villain in those six issues? Yeah, Whereas, we did like, Six issues is the minimum. Like, if, if you're going to get canceled, it's probably going to be after six issues or yeah. six issues. Mm-hmm. So, it's yeah, it's interesting that they started a storyline and did, didn't make any steps to resolve it at all in the first <laughs> half year. Yeah. Um, but that being said, so this big villain who was finally revealed, it turns out to be Karma's half-sister. Yeah. Um, so those of you who know Karma know that she has seems to have siblings coming out of the woodwork. Her origin story was like her brother was this evil mutant or something like that, and yeah. she had to save her two younger siblings from her evil brother. Um, and then her younger siblings always like turn up randomly throughout the years to like calls her, like, Ajita, and they never seem to age. Like, no. it's been, like, 20 years, and they're still, like, 12. And yeah. she has gone from, like, 16 years old to, like, you know, librarian. I assume she's, like, 25 or something like that. Um, so, like, <laughs> kids need to, like, go to college and, like, you know, yeah. watch some Pell Grants. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> but, so... Um, they should at least be emancipated now. That's mm-hmm. all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so, so I had mixed feelings about this, like, uh, so A, it, it was kind of strange because, like, her, her, her half-sister, which was, like, already kind of, like, like, a soap opera kind of, like, thing to happen to bring in this random half-sister from, like, out of, out of the blue. Yeah. Um, uh, B, it wasn't really, so, like, I don't, so, her half-sister doesn't have powers, right? Right. She did. She was a mutant. And then she got depowered. And then now she just takes over people with nanobots. Nanobots. Yeah. Nanobots. Okay. Um, and then okay. And then with the third thing that didn't make sense to me was that like after she like takes over these X Men with these nanobots. Yeah. Um, uh, so, a like, why did you choose like what was such like a sucky team of X Men to like take over, right? And sucky. Then, what do you mean? They just so Celia Ray's. She just got powered up by Marjorie Liu. Yeah, but she's so also like, been like, like she's been like, you know, like out of uniform for a really long time. Celia Ray's is one of my favorite X characters, and I am not gonna fault some supervillain for having good taste in it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, also, so... like Iceman is routinely shown to be like the crazy powerful one who just hasn't come into his own yet. And I don't now that they melted him to death, he's about to go balls to the wall. Yeah. Um, I've never really kind of like and they're all like, oh Iceman's like the, the unsung Omega Little Mutant. I'm like, whatever. I don't believe it. Like But there was that one issue where Emma Frost took over his body, like transferred into his body and just did like all sorts of crazy crazy stuff. It was like, you're an idiot. You don't even know how to use any of your powers. Awesome. Okay, so, okay, well, I need to get back to my third point. So my third point was, oh. like, so, A, so she, she's taken over this, like, random-ass group of, like, X-Men. It's not even a team. They're not even a team. There's, like, random people hanging out in, in camp. It's, like, loft or something. But that um, is my favorite. That's my favorite <laughs> team of X-Men. When Mike Carey did that, that was, like, the golden era of X-Men. Oh. Yeah, okay. So, whatever. So, like, she, 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 hijink, she hijacks this team. Of X Men, and then she sends them to like take over Madripoor, and I'm like, <laughs> what? That's so fucking random. And like, no, is this still, like, no, weird, like, Southeast Asian like need to like take over like Madripoor. <laughs> like, I don't get it. Then but it's be... not. It's not random. Who Why was the last random? person to take over Madripoor? Dakin. Or did you Under... try to? What writer? Oh, Marjorie you Liu. Yep. With Gambit. Oh, so. Oh, so Marjorie Liu has a hard on for Mantra Four. Marjorie Liu, yeah. I mean, and the other thing is, it kind of then makes everything make sense because Gambit is so. a team of X Men. That's where Gambit was when she took over these people, and okay. Gambit is the last person to have been involved in a takeover beside X twenty three and Dakin, who's off. Okay. In, 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 so. 
Okay, and then my last gripe about is going to be about Mad Report, which I don't fucking understand this city. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> it, it, okay, so my thing with, with Mad Report is it's, it's, it's like it's my same problem with the Drow in Dungeons and Dragons. All you nerds out there who should know who the Drow are, but the Drow are the you know are the dark elves, and their society is based on like thievery and murderers and psychopaths, and basically like, they're like everything that the good elves aren't. They're the evil elves, right? So their society right. is all about based on chaotic evilness. Um, I don't understand how a society like that subsists and doesn't collapse on itself. And there would be no way for people to have baby elves and you kill everyone because your mother's a psychopath. So, like, how does Madripoor <laughs> even... Because, like, Madripoor is, 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 like, is, like, this, like, freaking economic, like, like, jewel in the Pacific Ocean. It's, like, freaking Singapore. And... It's all written with crime, and everyone's like, a, like freaking, it's it's the crime island of Southeast Asia, and like, why does it exist? Does well, it like, make sense? there is. I was listening to NPR today, and they were talking about. Oh, I'm gonna mess up this country's name. That's why I'm not running for public office. Is it? No, I don't. I can't even remember. It's yeah. some country, it's like and they've been. Gotham. Why does anyone live in <laughs> Gotham? Like, move okay, out. Exactly. Exactly. It's the you. The, it's just what's happening above you, you know? Like, if our presidential candidates had to fight each other for the office, it wouldn't affect our daily lives. Yeah. Also, Unless we the joined the campaign. I, I, okay. I, uh, tiger, tiger, like T-Y-G-E-R, <laughs> T-I-G, I oh, like that's freaking, I'm sorry. <laughs> My name's Tiger, Tiger. I don't even know what her deal is, but I just love that she's like, Always in Madripoor. It's like she's like she's the only constant character in Madripoor, and yeah. just everyone's like. And she's also really bad at her. She's also really really shitty at her job. Yeah. She's like, this is my city, and she never knows what's going on, and everyone's taking over it. <laughs> Here's what I like about this storyline. Okay. I like that it took the cliche trope of uh, like mind controlled karma. Like, her power, it gets inverted on her all the time. Blah. And then it expanded it to everyone else on the team so that now Karma is the most badass, most experienced member of this team. Mm -hmm. And I like that. And I think that came across this issue. And I hope that it means that she's going to be awesome. And I hope she gets a gun for life. But we all... It, I'm, just, I'm just putting it out there, Marjorie, that it's my birthday next month. And Carver should have a gun for a leg. <laughs> it would be very apropos for Match Report. Just to yeah. stick a gun onto that. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that's I think we are all loving Astonishing X yeah. even if we have so many gripes about it. Uh -huh. is that accurate? No, 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 yeah, it is, it is, it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a lot. I I love this issue. I thought this issue dialed up the action. It finally got the plot moving. Whereas before it was kind of like, oh, now we're fighting this random team that's being controlled by robots, and now we're getting married because that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm happy to get some focus on this mm -hmm. plot. Yeah, it's good. Okay, let's talk about X Factor, a very plot focused book. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that I was so I'm not a huge fan of Terry uh, or uh, Siren, and like I just don't I just never really like found an interest in her. Mm -hmm. um, but I really thought the storyline with her becoming spoilers the next Morgan um, really interesting, um, and uh, I, I mean like I think it, it really. Like, it's like, you know, for the longest time, she was just kind of like, oh, she's, like, a copycat character. You know, her dad's Banshee, and she also has sound powers. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. I mean, she, she's always going to be playing second fiddle to, like, you know, that, her father. Okay. Um, but I think but I think that, that this actually takes her character into a whole different direction, which is interesting. Um, and I'm also interested about how X-Factor has become, like, Justice League Dark for the X-Men. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Do you think... Now that both they're splitting, they're kind of splitting up the team. It seems because like looks like Guido is joining Darwin. Like, mm -hmm. are they joining forces? So I it looks so. like they're splitting up the team, and they put a god on either side. Would you say that that's accurate? Um, 
is oh yeah okay yeah because Darwin's and they, like they, hell of powers. I, do you think that yeah? Do you think that they're dividing up the team to be two rival factions and have them go to war? Um, I guess that would make sense, but I don't know who else would join Darwin though. I, yeah. I mean, I guess there's one more issue of the day of like the it's like the five the four days or the five days of when of like X Factor splitting apart. So yeah. It'll be interesting to see if anyone else leaves, but yeah, and we know we know that Havoc's leaving for uh, A plus X. Um, yes. Uh -huh. And who knows what's happening with Polaris? I'm so happy she's not crazy. Yeah, that was getting really annoying. Um, also, I was like, "Good job, Magneto, you know, being a shitty father." Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my daughter's had a really traumatic experience. Let me get my henchman to mind fuck her, like. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, okay. Speaking of uh, women, fat women. <laughs> like, like, as in, that was smooth as silk. <laughs> um. So this issue of Batwoman was, I will say, awesome. Um. I really enjoyed it a lot. It got kind of it reexamines uh Batwoman's um origin story. Uh, and so, for those of you who have not read Batwoman, the first kind of uh, proper run of Batwoman, not on... Actually, was Batwoman Elegy? Was that Detective Comics? Or was that Batwoman? That was Detective Comics, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. for those of you who have not read Batwoman Elegy, written by Greg Greca, it's awesome and amazing. Um, and kind of set up one of the best kind of origin... Not even stories, but it's like, it kind of sets up a whole kind of like structure for this character that was like really masterful. Um, One of the things that I really loved about Greg Rucka's run with Batwoman on uh, on Detective Comics was that it was a very, it was a consummate example of someone setting up a mythology for a character. Yeah. Which no, is it's like, everything yeah, I, for a fiction. It felt character. like, it's very rare I feel like in comic books when you open a book and you feel like you're reading something iconic. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's, a, it must have been what people felt like when they opened up, you know, like, the Dark Phoenix saga. Yeah. I feel like that's, you know, so just saying that. Um, but I love that this one went uh, back and kind of really examined um, kind of all of the nooks and crannies in um, Kat Kane's history that we didn't even look at, especially her relationship with her father, which has kind of been on the back burner. Because um, yeah. like, she's just been avoiding her dad, and her dad has just kind of been moving around. Um, so that was awesome. Uh, it was really fun to see Renee Montoya for a frame, but I was like, Renee Montoya, uh, and it, it kind of like kind of yeah, there was a twinge in my heart because I think recently, very recently, like the the question was finally introduced to the new two, and it's not Renee, and it's kind yeah. Of like, I mean, they so. introduced they introduced the question in the free comic book day issue that was previewing Trinity War, and oh, yeah, it was okay. some white dude. But I also don't think it was the the same question that we classically had. I mean, maybe it's the uh, same okay. character name, but it's a I think it's a vastly different character. Um, okay. So, but who knows? Maybe they'll hand it off to Renee. That would be awesome. I'm a big yeah. fan of Renee and Kate. I think that is super yeah. really awesome. No offense, whatever her girlfriend's name is, I can't remember. That's the whole her. offense. It's who are you? <laughs> and I yeah, think, I just. I, I just think she looks like Hillary Clinton's Rick in 1992. <laughs> I'm like, why are you dating Hillary Clinton? <laughs> why are you dating Hillary Clinton? I mean, I love Hillary Clinton, and I would yeah, probably date Hillary yeah. Clinton, but Batwoman. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah, I love that issue. There were a lot of other issue zeros that were a little disappointing that I want to call out. Okay. Uh, I want to call out Teen Titans for telling me that they were going to show the origin of Skitter and Bunker in addition to Tim Drake. And what they meant was that they were going to draw those two characters in one panel. Yeah. So, no, sorry, Teen Titans Zero. That was terrible. Negative 10 points from Gryffindor. Uh, or negative 10 points to Gryffindor. Yes, yeah, so that's how negatives work. Um, and then the other one was Justice League Zero, which was showing the origins of John Constantine. Um, and I was really hoping that they would have some sort of like queer shout out to his, you know, kind of queer uh, history in the Vertigo comics, uh, but no dice. 
it was just him and Zatanna, and there wasn't even, like, him flirting with the TSA agent or anything. You had an interesting take, though, Jason. Yeah, well, and so I, I found that his relationship, so uh, Constantine, uh, he and Zatanna become, like, apprentices of this guy, Nikki, who is a, uh, some sorcerer, um, and I, they had this little threesome kind of, like, three like, relationship, not actual relationship, but, like, it was, like, they were a group of three. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, like, Nikki and Zatanna, and then, like, uh, um, Constantine was, like, they had, like also was, like, had this relationship with, uh, with Nikki. And, like, it, I mean, technically it was all platonic, but I felt that there was something about it. Uh, there was something about, like, uh, John Constantine's admiration of Nikki and, like, and, like the kind of, like, teacher thing that happened that I uh, don't necessarily think that, you know, they were banging boots, knocking boots, rather, but I definitely think it's right for subtext. So, just there saying. was a really interesting moment in that comic that I thought was going to be important that ended up not panning out into anything. But that kind of speaks to that idea of them having something more. And that was when they got tattoos together. Yeah, and... that, it was just like this total, like, really emotional yeah. like, connection. And the, and the line that they said was that now they were a coven, now they yeah. were one being, which is... Uh, biblical language for knocking boots. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, what else do we got? Oh, I want to say, guys, uh, I read Morning Glories, and in addition to it being an incredibly awesome book that is so uh, amazing in writing and art and concept, it also has a really awesome queer character who is kick-ass and interesting and has... And Asian! And, and Asian! And... and yeah, and Asian, and has the hottest gay scene I have ever seen in a comic book mm-hmm. that I have ever seen. Maybe, maybe your opinion of class comics is much higher than mine. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was it was very nice. I uh, so a few things about Morning Glory. Um, I really like the storyline. It's mm-hmm. really great. It's very lost. Like yeah, sort of in terms of like the meta plot and like there's so many twists and turns and time travel and limbo. What? Um, uh, so that's fun. Um, one thing I do want to call out is that they, I mean, like it's to- it totally makes sense in terms of like the narrative and like you know the dramatic art, but they reuse a lot of art. <laughs> they reuse a yeah. lot of stuff because well, things happen over and over again. But it, like it's kind of weird because it's like like they use whole like. Like, they'll, they'll, they'll reprint a whole, like, Page. two pages. Yeah, two pages, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it's like, I get, like, why that would, why you would do that. Right. Um, but it, it just seems like a big waste of pages. And if I was, and if I was paying, like, for a week, week I would feel really ripped off of, like, a 24-page book to have, like, two of it being pages I've already seen before. But that being said, um, it is a good book. Yeah. And I think it's really hilarious how uh, the headmistress has a, a improbably sized bun on her head. Because it's just, <laughs> there's, there's no way that that bun exists without like psychic telekinetic powers. Hey, look, it's morning glories. Don't rule out that scenario. <laughs> um, I'm I'm okay. I, so I bought most of all of these issues on sale. There was a back to school sale on Comixology, and so I, I just was like, I've been meaning to get it. I'll get it. And then I was like, This is the, my favorite queer character. Yeah. Um, but I, it def- What I think is interesting is how much of a different feel those scenes have. Um, yeah, that's true. With with the amount of stuff that they reveal, and one of the things that I like about, and I don't know if Lost said this. I'm sure they couldn't have. N- contradicted this sentiment uh, without inciting rage. Uh, but the writer has said that this is a 100-issue story, and so he knows he's plotted everything out. Which, well, thank goodness for that. Right? Hopefully will mean we won't be heartbroken. Um, the solicit for issue number 25, which is coming out at the end of this year, or mm-hmm. there has been no new issue this month, so... Oh. Um, but the solicit for that says that it's the end of season one. Okay. So hopefully that means there will only be four seasons. Mm-hmm. Oh, there are four seasons. Yeah. Um, and yeah. 
So I'm excited for it. I think it's a great book, and I believe in the propaganda. Um, and as we're giving shout-outs to cool queer characters in independent comic books, that's my segue, um, <laughs> I recently bought a, uh, a, I guess a, I'm not sure if it's an omnibus or a, a trade paperback, but it's a collection uh, of, a, of, a, of a story called Spira, S-P-E-R-A. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of awesome. It's uh, a set, um, it, it's, it's a story about two princesses who run away to save the world, basically, with their... Um, Fire spirit fox friend, um, but one of the princesses is like this like traditional like girly princess who reads and like she's kind of like Belle from like Sleeping Beauty, um, but then the other princess is total like tomboy gender queer like sword. She's she's Utna basically. She's Utna, and <laughs> it's awesome. And everyone who likes gender queer uh, boy princesses should. Jason. Jason, have I told you? Have I told you that when I grow up, I want to be the Rose Bride? <laughs> Anthony, Anthony, they're really close. They're really yeah, close. Uh -huh. I started reading Spira and did not even get that that was another princess. Oh yeah, right. So <laughs> that is some straight up male presentation right there. Mm -hmm. So totally. I'm very excited now. I will go back and check those issues out. Um, awesome. And I'm so happy you, you just referenced Revolutionary Girl Udna. <laughs> I can't tell you how much of my childhood that was. Um, the other, uh, I just watched an anime that was amazing. Yeah. Uh, Puella Magi Modoka Magica. Okay, that sounds like everything that I would want to watch. Yeah. Um, it's kind of an inversion of the magical girl uh, genre. Okay. It's amazing. It's only 12 episodes long. Nice. Uh, 12 22-minute episodes, and it is ridiculous and so wonderful. Awesome. And, um, yeah, check it out. You will love the animation. They go so trippy. If you like Revolutionary Utna and how they were just like, what? Physics and reality? <laughs> F that. Blah. You will love uh, Quilla Magi. And uh, yeah, it's interesting because they they've done other things, but the story for Puella Magi Maruka is self-contained, and so every other one is a different Puella Magi. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty nifty. Okay, I think that uh, this has been our first Google Hangout. We didn't mention that. Um, yeah. Oh, also. I went to Dragon Con. We haven't asked it since that. Yeah, I'm so jealous. This is the first year that I haven't been there in many, in several years. I, I, only in two years. But still, I was so sad that I was not there. I was very jealous. Things that you missed. One, um, uh, all the husband's panels. I went to all of them. Yes. Um, oh, and um, the Sean Maher thing. Yeah. That was awesome. Yes, your question went off so well. Everyone loved it. Um, all right. Yeah, and uh, okay. So for those of you being at home, just uh, just so you to give you context, I asked Anthony to ask Sean Maher, who played uh, Simon Tam on Firefly, who recently came out of the closet. Not Simon, uh, the actor. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the question was, um, in light of your recent coming out, um, who would you like to have seen Simon? What what, what other male? Uh, Crewmate, would you have liked Simon to um, knock boots with? The best part of me asking that question, I would like you to know, is that halfway through, the audience got where I was going, and Sean got where I was going, and everyone was very excited. <laughs> and so the answer was... So the answer was, uh, he put them in order, and so he at first he was like, not Jane. And then he was like, not Shepard. That would be sacrilegious. Um, so he put Wash first. And then he put uh, the captain. And then he said, OK, Jane third. And then I was like, OK, thank you. And I started <laughs> walking away. And he said, actually, remember in that flashback where Kaylee is hooking up with that guy in the engine room? And that, that's, that's, that's who he picked. <laughs> 
<laughs> Which is a very good choice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So all of you, all, all of you slash writers out there, you have been <laughs> given, you have been uh, heed the call. I expect, I expect a slash fan fiction in our mailbox by exactly. next time we we, we hang out. And given that Kaylee has expressed an interest in both these young men, uh, there's no reason, no reason why uh, you can't uh, keep the OTP happening. Yeah, it could be like a Justice League, Justice League Dark Zero. Kind of <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, also, uh, John Barrowman and his husband wagged their junk in our faces, so that was nice. Yeah, and they dropped trout, I heard. That's what, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You oh, guys okay. picture? I, I believe I have. Yeah, I didn't. I was not in a position to get a picture of that. But my favorite thing from not being a Dragon Con, the thing that I saw at Dragon Con, was the fact that that a bunch of cosplayers restaged North Star's marriage to Kyle, but there were actually two cosplayers who were getting married, and that was kind of awesome. Yeah, I heard about that when I was at Con, but I didn't get to see it. But it was amazing. Yeah, I have a picture. I got a picture back from the internet. Thanks, the internet. <laughs> There's so many things at Con that I didn't see that I now have pictures of. <laughs> well, um, on that note, uh, thank you for tuning in to This Is You, The Scarlet Fetch, and be sure to stay tuned.